Good evening and welcome back to Byline. This is a public affairs show here at Amherst Media and it's co-sponsored by our Amherst League of Women Voters. And uh, we're trying to help our friends and neighbors here in town uh, follow what's going on as we're transitioning from our old form of government to our new form of government. And we have two guests this evening uh, from our Community Resources Committee, which is one of the official committees of our town council, right? And so we have the chair of the committee, Mandy Jo Haneke, and we have the vice chair, Dorothy Pam. And we want to welcome you. Uh, for each of you, this is uh, a return visit because you've each Thank been you. here a few times. And it just goes to show we're almost finishing a year of these shows. So fortunately, you folks have been willing to come on and spend some time with us a few times already. So thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. let's start from the beginning. Let's remind people what the Community Resources Committee is. What's the charge? Where did it come from? How'd you all get together? Yeah, so I'm learning that again myself being a couple weeks into chairmanship but it is one of the five standing committees of the council as you said and we refer to it as crc but it is called the community resources committee and it is it was formed to advise the council on matters relating to housing zoning master plan planning um, arts and culture um, did I miss any? Transportation. Transportation. Economic and development. development. Yeah, and there's a whole list. This is the potpourri catch-all committee. In a way, in yes, a way. in a way. Um, and we do it through making recommendations to the council, but we can also come up with offering our own policies on things like land use or transportation mm -hmm. and public way mm -hmm. use, as, as Dorothy was saying, and things like that. But um, even the ones you come up with still require the town oh, council's yes. action. Yes, we are only So advisory. you are advisory yes. in all respects. And uh, so proposals that others are making are sent over to you guys for review and, and to make recommendations back to the council. Yes. And similarly, though, you can create some of your own right. if, you, if you'd like. Okay, so that's, uh, that's where it comes. And it's not a committee that was required in the charter. Nope, it's one we thought as a council that yeah. we needed a, a smaller group to really dig into those policy um, proposals that might be coming to us or bylaw amendments that might be coming to us, especially in bylaws relating to zoning, um, to look at the pros and cons and be able to dig in, investigate, research, ask the questions, and then come back with a comprehensive report to the council so that they can really deliberate knowledgeably. Okay. Right. And um, so I know, oh, go ahead. It, it got off to a bit of a slow start because many of us knew that we wanted something, but we weren't quite sure what. So we had a series of discussions over a period of weeks and actually a few months, in which we outlined what would be in this committee, what would not be in the committee. Um, and it took us a while, but we then we basically, I think we sum it up under quality of life as the overall. Um, but that includes many, many things. Right. So. Quality of life, I love that. It's a, <laughs> yes. it's a really good catch-all yeah. overall phrase. And among the things that fit into the quality of life are the public ways, yes. which we all use. So, Dorothy, I know you've given some special attention to that subject. So why don't you kick off a, a description of what you folks have been doing and thinking about and discussing right. in the area of public ways. Well, it certainly didn't come from the council. It's come from the people, from the residents. And so we would have our district meetings and we would go planning to talk about some of our larger things that we're doing, thinking of our capital projects. And what we were hearing from the people uh, and it didn't matter a um, wide variety of people, it wasn't any certain subset of the population, was that we had to work on our roads and our sidewalks, um, that it wasn't really safe and easy to get around. So that has included, I, I get communications on a regular basis with new aspects. Um, the crosswalks, are, do we have crosswalks? If we do, have they been painted so people can see them? Are the signs there to slow the traffic down? because it is a, a family town and a student town. We have people who walk, and so people have to be able to cross our streets safely. Um, just at a uh, meeting with some UMass students this past week, when uh, a general question, well, what are some of the things that interest you, that you would like change, or you'd like us to do? And I was quite surprised and actually pleased that some of them said, the crosswalks are too dark, because they're coming at it from a different point. Mm -hmm. um, 
dri I said, well, as a driver, it has certainly bothered me greatly that when I come to a crosswalk, people are dressed in black, they're dark, poorly limited, uh, lighted, and we can't see. And the students both agreed, as drivers and walkers, that they were very nervous at the crosswalks. And, and there was a student who, um, we have had some fatalities. Mm -hmm. So there's concern about um, that kind of safety, about speed limits. Uh, we've had done some inquiry uh, to whether we should lower the speed limit within the town, as many other comparable towns have done. Um, we also have to deal with um, the overall question of how are people getting around and where are the cars going to park. So it's, you start off with one small thing and it, it has ramifications that go into all aspects. And so the parking issue is one that um, is very tied to economic development. It's not just mm -hmm. safety and can you go up and down your street uh, without being hit by a, hitting a parked car, but it's also if we're having a movie or having an event, can people come in town and find a place to park? Mm -hmm. So it's a major overall that affects uh, the downtown more than anything. But um, we have had a lot of focus on the downtown this year. So, so there have been actually, you mentioned uh, parking, so there have been a number of um, parking garages proposed over time, additional parking mm -hmm. garages. Do you think we're heading in the direction of eventually seeing another garage downtown? Any opinion on that? <laughs> So, Public um, or private? Uh, potentially private. I know there are private. some discussions going on about a potential private um, that might involve some council action depending on where they want to put it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, okay. it, we've heard some, some whispering yes. uh -huh. that, that there is some private or nonprofit talk of um, trying to propose a parking and garage. And do you think the community generally is, uh, is favorably inclined toward another garage? Because I remember the the large controversy for the very small garage we ended up creating uh, in Bangs, <laughs> around the Bangs Center. So, so I don't know, but that would be something that if, if a w request to change a zoning to allow a parking garage in a certain area or funding or mm -hmm. transfer of land yeah. or something comes to the town council, if it's going to be a private or nonprofit b development, that CRC would would, would that, likely that be would part be where the discussion would happen, okay. and yeah. all those pros right. and cons that Dorothy just mentioned um, okay. about you know impacts to economic development, but also to the streets and the residents on whatever street they might be looking at, if that's the case, right. you know things like that 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 we'd have to tackle and yeah. deal with. Right. Good. Well, we we have a parking study, and I've been going to, to a number of the meetings, and they have a lot of suggestions, some of which are receiving um, people like, and some that they don't. But one aspect was very important. It said that for the town to build another parking garage, it would cost us about 140000 per parking space. Mm -hmm. And the town is at this moment trying to uh, envision and uh, deal with four major capital projects. And a parking garage, we can't, we can't afford to fix that. Isn't on the, it's, it's not it's on the not tick there. list at this That's time. Right. Right. But it, but, uh, so therefore, a private proposal whether it's a not-for-profit or a private entity yeah. coming forward um, might be a welcome proposal for the community right. to help address our parking needs yeah. without uh, further burdening the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, go, going back to the crosswalks for a second, I'm sorry I took a little diversion right. there. <laughs> no. You said it's parking all and it just came to it's my all mind. Connected, though. Yes. So um, how, do we light how do we light crosswalks? Well, there's several ways. One is to have a, some kind of a street light that's a little brighter. Uh -huh. um, we, we, it's always a balance. Okay, people who live in apartments don't, don't want to have lights going into their into windows. Their room. So yeah. one of the concerns in zoning is are the lights shaded down and how are the lights? And they, this is always part of of what they consider. But it could be brighter lights there. Or uh, Amherst College has um, these little stanchions that flash. Uh -huh. So okay. at least it, if in the dark you can say, oh, something's coming up. Got it. Um, Got so it. one of the things as a result of this intense um, uh, residential talking about um, the whole um, safety issue on sidewalks and roads is that the uh, town manager has, um, I'd say, lifted the question of roads and sidewalks in terms of our capital budget almost as, not quite, but almost as a fifth capital project. Mm -hmm. We are very behind uh, part of the exercise of getting Amherst's finances in really good shape, which they have been doing. I mean, they definitely have done. So that we, our, our debt is lower and has been perhaps maybe not spending as much on roads as perhaps we're saying now maybe we wish they would. 
but we just have this whole, it's a juggling act constantly. Yeah. We want to go forward with these large capital projects, yet we want to have a safer, happier downtown where people walk happily and, it, you know, day and evening and, and go to our, whatever we have in terms of social and uh, restaurant life. Okay, so let's shift gears here and talk about another subject. So um, you advise town council, yes. uh, but you also collaborate with other boards and entities in town. And uh, we have a very active affordable housing trust yes. that's been developing proposals. What's your interaction and your connection to work with a group like that? Well, so the most recent one has been that they've been developing a ho affordable housing priorities policy mm -hmm. um, that they've taken on wonderfully on their own to, to come up with and say, we, we need a policy and we're going to develop it. Um, you know, council may be too busy to, to really devote it extended amounts of time to this, so we're the Affordable Housing Trust, let's develop something. And they did, and they said it's in draft form, but they came to the council, they've come to the planning board, they've gone to the Community Preservation Act Committee and many of the other committees that deal with affordable housing and entities in town and said, give us your feedback. And so the council took that request and said, send that off to CRC, to the Community Resources Committee. They're the ones tasked with recommending and advising stuff on policies to housing. Right. And so our committee, the Community Resources Committee, has been and has finalized its feedback. Um, we had many discussions over five or six different meetings about the proposed policy, not on whether we should adopt it or not, because it's not at that stage, mm -hmm. but on it's presented to us in draft form. What what do we think needs tweaked or is missing or is good about it? And then we, we've drafted a memo. That memo is in an upcoming council packet for publication to the council, though, because we are advisory. Right. So that memo is addressed to the council and says, here's after our discussions and our looking at it, what we think our feedback, the council's feedback should be to, to this trust, trust. Mm -hmm. and, and so it hasn't gone to the trust yet because right. it's the council's job to send it to it but some of the things we came up with in reading the policy um, the proposed policy was that it addresses affordable housing but it doesn't really address housing affordability right. mm -hmm. and we as counselors you know the trust their focus is on affordable housing and which the means which which means housing that meets um, the state housing inventory guidelines for 80% or affordable for 80% of median income households and below. So it looks at one, one cohort of people. Cohort, yes. Can they, do they have housing in your community? And can they afford it? And yeah. can they afford it? And the other version? Is, is can people of many different economic means, including mostly those above that 80% Mm -hmm. line to maybe 120, 130, 150, can they afford housing mm -hmm. in our community? In community? And so one of our feedbacks was, well, it addresses this one small thing, but we're the council. And the council says, we want a comprehensive community. policy, right. not just one yes. small set Got of it. it. Um, you but know, remember, they were set up for, for affordable just housing, that. so yes. they did their right. job. So they did their job. But, but you're we, saying, wait a minute. You asked for feedback, and we want <laughs> more. <Yeah. laughs> and they say, and, and we had we had the the chair of the trust yeah. to our meetings and he said but that's Who's not our job a couple of times <laughs> yes. Yes. and he says that's not our job right. so one of the other things we said is you know this is this is to, to us it looks like a great goals document yeah. but we would love to see more um, implementation sort of strategy you know goals are great but if we're looking at a policy we think a policy might better be how do you deal with that funding. We've got funding, where does it go? Not just we need more housing, but how are you gonna allocate that funding? What's gonna be the highest priority when you're looking at funding and things like that? So that's one of the feedback we did. And then I have to mention this because we're counselors, we all have different views. One of our feedback was very mixed. This proposed policy came in with a certain set of goals for units to create within a certain amount of time. Yeah. And some counselors on our committee and even probably within the council said, that's fantastic. Others said, we need those numbers higher. And others said, wait, 
we don't really want specific numbers in a specific time because that sets us potentially up for failure. And mm -hmm. as elected officials, right. we might not want to fail. So right. into our feedback document went this completely contradictory feedback of, mm -hmm. well, that's OK. It needs to be higher. And oh, maybe you need to delete it, <laughs> which may not be completely helpful to the trust, but is reflective of the counselor's yeah. views on reading the policy. And right. so this doesn't mean necessarily blow up the trust because no. they have an important right. focus, but you're saying, hey, we need to look at the bigger picture. Yes. And yes. I know, Dorothy, you, you represent downtown, mm -hmm. and you've been looking at the question of how to get more housing downtown, yes. and you want you don't want it to be gentrified. You want all kinds of people to be able to live and work and walk downtown. Can you add some thoughts to well, how, how you see this? See, part of it is we have a great pressure on housing because the university has been admitting more and more students for which they don't have dormitories. So one of our concerns is also preservation of existing housing and of viable neighborhoods. Uh, will owner-occupied houses be turned into just apartments for students with a no owner there? Uh, there are cases right now that are coming before us. I mean, zoning can keep some things out, but it also protects what's there. And um, for example, in the um, Lincoln Sunset um, uh, Historical District area, uh, the zoning there says that you can have, by right, uh, you can make your single family home into a two family if it's owner occupied. And so we can tell actually when you walk up and down the streets, you can tell when a house is owner occupied and when it's not. You tell by the quality of the front steps, the gardening, the landscaping. And that's one of the things I discovered in campaigning. Um, campaigning is good. It gets you on your feet, gets you walking, knocking on doors, talking to people, and seeing really close up what is not the same as what you see when you drive by. So um, we really strongly support that there should be owner occupancy of houses in, in the residential neighborhoods because um, you, you, could, you can walk up to a house, as I was doing a couple of weeks ago when I was doing some leafleting, uh, and you see a pile of pizza boxes, you know, maybe 10, 15 pizza boxes. That is not owner occupied. Mm -hmm. You know that because no owner would ever let that happen to their property. Mm. Um, so it's it's a, a matter of really trying to keep and protect what is working and what is good. But um, the zoning subcommittee is considering well, there can be maybe small supplemental dwellings. Maybe we can make it easier for some one family homes to add a, an apartment. Again, this is within the owner occupied rule. Um, so that's part of the infill. But as I was coming here today, I thought, OK, how much infill do we want? Do we want to lose our backyards? Do we want to lose the trees? And I don't think so. If you, if you talk to um, our tree experts, they talk about our, um, our urban forest, uh, our trees. And, and we have, yes, we have trees that fall down all the time in our crazy weather. But we've got some great trees. And they are part of the lungs of the town. So mm -hmm. I don't want us to become so dense. And um, I do remember that in New York City, tenements were infill development. They took a house, they had a courtyard, then they just built into the courtyard. So mm -hmm. there was just little alleyways and there were no trees, no grass, no anything. So making sure you have some green space and green some trees. Green space, trees. And so you can, you can breathe yourself and the community, That's the right. environment breathes That's because right. you and have so that. And so any, any new building downtown, uh, we're really concerned about um, are there ways that we can try to make future buildings. Um, uh, we've had a problem about our sidewalk. And there's rules that are in conflict. And so sometimes we have to say, OK, let's look at these rules and say, well, let's require. It's not just up to the sidewalk, because if it's a small sidewalk, then that's not a good situation. But to say, well, all downtown sidewalks might be, I think you said 10 feet or something. You um, could say that. You, yes, whatever it is. But uh, right now, it's a little bit. We know there's more building coming, and there's some concern what is the situation, what are the rules in existence, and what would be some better rules. And also keeping the sense that this is a New England town. This is Amherst, and you look at the pictures, and it's a, a beautiful town with a variety of building styles, and we don't want to lose that in just in the pursuit of building more and more housing and having more density. Um, we're going to build more housing. Private developers are going to build more housing, but we hope that it will include I mean, one of the ideas is that if we just have a clearer inclusionary zoning law, right now it's complicated and it hasn't What's, resulted. What is an inclusionary zoning law? Well, that if you're going to build something new, that you include some units that are going to be um, uh, affordable. Affordable. 
affordable to a wide range of people. We're not we're not back to uh, Mr. Hornick's no, affordability we, we where would be, actually. you no, would we be. You would back. say that okay. some yes. units would be according to the average monthly. Um, income or whether it's okay. going to be the 80 percent, the 50 percent, or the 30 percent, that it's um, not, and what I, that, that also does is that, that it makes a, uh, a more of a varied place. Okay. We don't want to have it all, this is all this, this is all students, this is all people who really uh, have a lower incomes, this is all that. We, we'd like to have um, more uh, intergenerational aspects and to have the people together because we are together. So in, in keeping with that, let's stay with that for a second. So if on the one hand, we want to broaden the community's conversation about housing, uh, available housing for a variety of incomes, right. and we have this Massachusetts law which directs communities to have at least 10% affordable, that's the people you were talking about yes. that uh, Mr. Hornick that's and right. his yes, committee yes. are looking at, yes. is there a way when you design an inclusionary zoning mm -hmm. uh, scheme to flip it a little bit and go back to the point you were making earlier about making sure that you can have a variety of groups incomes considered not yes. just yeah. market and right. so this maybe yes, the not maybe, maybe not. not okay um, let's and, see and where this, this is, goes this is where you know many of the ideas Dorothy was just stating are stuff that the planning board would have to propose in okay. a sense because they're in charge of zoning right. yeah. um, and they may propose some of them they may not and then it would come to CRC and we would look at it and and go through all mm -hmm. of that what do we want what don't we want and each of us have different opinions on that but mm -hmm. in terms of that there's state laws um, that man you know that that identify what affordable means but then also who in terms of where town money can sort of be given, um, especially Community Preservation Act money that goes to housing, and how that can go towards affordable housing. And, mm -hmm. and there are restrictions as to what type of affordable housing they can go to, and so it, and much of that is below this 80% um, area median income number. Mm -hmm. um, and when you get above that, the restrictions say, well, you can't give that taxpayer money to support housing at 100 or 120 right. of that line. So, okay. so an inclusionary zoning bylaw says when you're building market rate housing, which may or may not be affordable for someone making 120 mm -hmm. of the area median income, it might only be affordable. And affordable has a, has a specific definition right. of spending no more than about 30% 30%. of your income yeah. right. on housing. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what your income level is, that's where they sort of say affordable is. And so when we say affordable for 80% area median income, that means afford that, thir that rent or that mortgage payment is 30% of someone's 80% level of area median right. income. And, and so we can't give money for some of this to those making, you know, to make okay. housing affordable mm -hmm. for that. It's developers. And, and so much goes into that. I don't know whether zoning can address well, if you're going to develop something, you have to have something in here. Yeah. But we can do some of the zoning with inclusionary zoning for those that the state allows us to. So state laws and definitions play a role in yes. it. Yes. Yes. The rules around specific pots of money. Yes. Plays a role in that. So both of those might have to be uh, tweaked mm -hmm. in order for a broader. Because yeah. imagine the possibility we're going to build 30 units. We're going to build a building with 30 units. Mm -hmm. Imagine the possibility that it's a really mixed community. There's room for seniors, for mm -hmm. students who just graduated from UMass who are working here, mm -hmm. uh, for um, families, small families or empty nesters being able to move into the building but, uh, er, but need a, a, a unit that is just in the right cost range, yes. and then the affordable units that we traditionally talk about of the people with the lowest incomes. Mm -hmm. So imagine trying to create that building with that community. Really what tough. rules would we have yep. to change yeah. at the state level and at the local mm -hmm. level to try to make that that community, that building as a community come together. So it's just a thought. But yeah. so and and speaking of all of this, we're we're now getting into master planning, we're getting to uh, zoning. Yeah. 
you have a role, your committee has a role in that. I but, was just going to But there are others that. who have yeah. a role. Go ahead. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. Let's see where you go. When you're looking at that, it, the planning board is, is sort of the entity that proposes changes to the zoning, which may be able to do some of this that we mm -hmm. were just talking about. And so right now we've had the charter required master plan forum for the council and so the council's starting to get into that and we have to figure out how we work with the planning board on the master plan but also on the zoning bylaws and so hopefully in the coming weeks we'll get a referral to the community resources committee to sort of work through that that initial how do we do this and that referral would be to work with the planning board because they own the master plan by state law they must approve it and they have approved our current one there's a lot of thinking that it needs updated and so if it's referred to the Community Resources Committee, we would work with them to say, hey, these are where the council thinks it might need updated. You can do what the updates you think you need. Mm -hmm. You need to approve it again, and then we can do our charter mandated approval of the master plan once it's been updated, but work with them for that. And then for zoning bylaws, as Dorothy was mentioning, a whole lot mm -hmm. that both counselors and planning committee members, and they don't always agree on right. what those changes mm -hmm. yeah. are, yeah. Um, but there's a lot out there that have been talked about as potential changes, to go in and work with the planning board and say, here's what we counselors have been thinking, mm -hmm. um, here, do what you're thinking, come up with maybe a comprehensive or a much larger potential modification to the zoning bylaws that might deal with a number of these issues all at once, but work with them to figure out how that would work because in this form of government, in, a, in this, the new one new, we have, yeah. um, not just the planning board has to hold a hearing on any bylaw changes, but the council does too. And so mm -hmm. we actually have a direct role in sort of the, the hearing part of the people beyond what we would mm -hmm. normally do under state law to hold a hearing. And the council has adopted that the CRC would be the committee that holds that state mandated hearing and hopefully does it with got the planning it. board. So yeah. we're going into a phase where we got to figure out how that that sort of dual role works, how mm -hmm. it's going to work. We'll try some stuff out and hopefully if it works it great. If it doesn't, we'll try something well, else what out. What we've heard from guests yeah. on this show over quite a mm -hmm. long period of time now is our master plan is still pretty solid. Yes. Our zoning is still pretty solid, but both could use some tweaking. Yes. So we're not throwing it all out. We're going to review and revise. Yep. And, and with, uh, with yep. that, we've come to our last word. And I want to thank you both for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, good luck. Keep up the great work. Thanks. And thank thanks you. Thanks again. Thank you.